and that's the focus of our topic today to uh, explain share so that we have a more clear precise understanding what this false personality is how was it formed um what are some of its characteristics features behaviors type of thinking feeling in which way it uh which way is it detrimental to awakening and detrimental to happiness basically to even human happiness um also we are going to link it or um, explore how it correlates with concepts like ego ego um the imaginary picture of oneself the separate self the mind made sense of self as well as what we call the non-duality the sense of me because ultimately they are very it's one and the same or they are different dimensions of the same type of let's say energy field or psychologically energy field or confusion illusory psychological energetic sense of identity Uh, there's also this idea of chi feature chi feature very important practical idea in the fourth way is that everybody has a certain core mechanical tendency around which the false sense of self false personality revolves around it's like a core pillar of this uh construction of the imaginary identity and some type of pattern some kind of psychological tendency to deal with other people with oneself with the world it's called chief feature chief mechanicality chief tendency when in sleep we are tend to operate from that as a way of being in the system um what they speak about somehow false personality is always connected right away versus essence you can give a little bit of context around that and mm -hmm. how false personality has been formed uh and when and yeah let's start the ball rolling i think uh, one way to start is <clears throat> with the the knowledge that when we are born we're not born with a false personality we're born just a simple nature what the fourth way calls essence and this false personality becomes as the words two words suggest personality persona a mask but instead of this mask representing our deeper true nature as we are born uh it becomes an artificial mask a fake mask and this mask then instead of being a representation of of what we are who we are and what we are internally just in our simple being, now this mask takes on a life of its own. And we now attach our sense of ourself to the mask. And it's, how, it's what we show to the world. And it's how we project ourselves primarily to other people. It's very interesting, for example, to watch a person with just a dog or a cat hmm. and no other people. They're, they're not in their false personality. Their mask is off, it's down. This mask, which has become a protective, psychological protection, protective device, a guard, and a false projection. We don't need it. Uh, we don't with, but when, we, as soon as we're around other people, we, the mask comes on automatically. And it has variations. It shifts, takes on a different hue, slightly different behavior when we're with our mate, when we're with our best friend, when we're with a stranger, when we're with our boss or our coworkers. When we meet new people uh, in different situations, we the mask adjusts itself slightly because we're adjusting our feeling of identity. And at our core, we remain the same, but we adjust this personality, this artificial projection of ourselves to meet the circumstances in a way that will allow us to hold firmly to this artificial sense of ourself that we've developed. And this is what in other teachings is called the ego. But the fourth way breaks it down a little more, well, in a, in a different way and very specifically to show it's not just, it is one thing, but it's also always changing, has slight fluctuations, variations. And this is why in the East they say the illusion is tricky. 
and it, it's elusive. And this is they're talking about this false personality. Um, examples of how this manifests, because inside we have this false sense of I. And the fourth way also calls this the imaginary picture of myself. You can call it the ego, imaginary picture of myself, false personality. And it's hard to see it internally at first. And so the way we begin to see it is to look at how it manifests outwardly. How do we act? What are the ways in which this gets projected to other people and to the world? We study that, and by virtue of studying that, we trace it back. It's like tracing back the... Um, the Wizard of Oz and finding our way all the way to his home and going inside and pulling the curtain back and seeing the ego back behind the curtain there operating this show, which is, and that's what false personality is. It's a show. It's a demonstration of identity, but it's false in the sense that it's not, it's not who we are at our core being. And it's not even a, a, an authentic representation of who we are at our core being. Because also I, I work with people and uh, we use the word ego and and I just talked to someone the other day and I explained about ego and they said, no, no, I, I don't have a, I don't have an ego like that. I don't have an ego. And then I realized that there's this misunderstanding. Um, sometimes ego is understood as being uh, arrogant or feeling superior, having an inflated uh, uh, self-importance. Look at me, you know, like a big shot or like a big shot politician, something like that. Um, and he was saying, no, I don't, I don't have that. But just to define terms, to be precise, um, even ego, uh, even the way Eckhart Tolle uses or other teachings, um, uh, non-duality, ego, separate self, even false personality, I would say that they are, it can take different shapes. It can be inflated, superior, self-importance, arrogant, taking space, obnoxious, look at me, vain, uh, controlling, uh, unempathetical, uh, bullying, you know, it can be like that. But it can equally be uh, falsely meek, uh, going against oneself, uh, not having boundaries in order to get approval, um, trying to be nice uh, when underneath one feels something else, self-pity, self-deprecation, I'm not good enough, there's something wrong with me, I'm a failure, uh, look at me, you know. So all of this, it's from the point of view of these teachings, They are. it's equally the same, equally the same fabric is the same, different side of the same coin, and um, the characteristic or to see behind this either inflated or deflated energy is that the, the belief, their thoughts, the feeling and the sensation and energy of being an autonomous, separate, independent me. Yeah, so that what, that's what we mean by ego. And everybody, unless have done a lot of specialized, arduous work, that's, that is, yeah, of course, I'm separate, independent, autonomous, me. Um, so that's what I mean by ego and false personality. Um, usually we, we, I mean, usually we are always born with, uh, they call it in the fourth way, essence. So there's this say, spirit or uh, being, that which perceives, uh, as you see babies, you know, there's there's no false personality, there's no baggage, there's no memory. It's just being aware, you know. That's that's the 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 most fundamental, essential aspect of our identity. But then in the fourth way, there is that there is also some kind of peculiarity, unique peculiarities connected to body type, to genes, to center of gravity to certain psychological and uh, tendencies uh, uh, as well as talents, you know. So, uh, and you can see with children, uh, although they are still very much in essence, um, they are different from each other, uh, even the young children. Uh, some are more uh, active or exploratory. Some are more 
quiet and observant. Uh, some are right away very attracted to building things. Some are more attracted to music. Um, some are more attracted to just nature. So there are different tendencies which are inbuilt, some uniqueness of the expression of this universal being energy. So this is, uh, and which is like a diversity, you know, the, the diversity um, on the planet. And, but what happens is that um, as soon as we are born, but especially as we start to learn words and language and interact with adults, and adults usually are, I would say, high percentage in false personality and asleep. Um, so for the process of uh, education, for the process of being taught how the world operates, concepts, how to be, uh, for the process of simple osmosis or, or imitation, uh, we are looking at our parents or at society uh, who are actually in false personality and we are becoming it. Mm -hmm. uh, another quality of this, one way to recognize false personality is a certain, um, they call it in the, in the fourth way, a certain hydrogen, but we can say a certain frequency or certain emanation, uh, which is very different than the emanations or frequency or hydrogen of essence. So essence seems tends to be sim more simple, more straightforward, more uh, innocent, pure, simple, uncomplicated, lighter, happier. <laughs> um, and false personality is this 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 uh, frequency of he more heavy, uh, encumbered, complicated, tortured, um, more deception, more uh, appearances. And it's a heavier, as we get more conscious, we actually sense this in people. We don't have to know this particular characteristic. It, there is, we sense it. There's a tendency in um, awakening work to look at the ego or false personality or separate self to um, make it as an enemy and to uh is the bad guy the devil actually in, in various spiritual traditions that's the devil um and to fight it and to make it wrong and to judge it um and it's important to realize that this this ego this false personality is actually acts as a protective was developed the child the teenager started to to develop these things in order to protect some kind of the vulnerability of essence the sensitivity of the heart, the feeling the impact of certain harsh words or certain people who don't care. So it's really, uh, it developed as a strategic adaptation to protect oneself and adapt to this world, which is, unless you are in a special jungle or in a tribe, this world is uh, aligned with false personality, the education, school system everything is false personality and false personality is initially is formed as to protect us then it becomes like as a way to um, stifle essence so that which initially protects us the mask the armor at some point kind of is glued to the face and we we don't know what is inside anymore there's nobody the the ten that the essence is almost Innocence, spontaneity, creativity is pushed away uh, in a corner there. We need to have this attitude of observing these tendencies, observing these stories, observing this energetic content without trying to get rid of it, without trying to judge it, without being upset with it and simply observing as a curious, interesting stranger, having this affectionate, loving, benevolent awareness of these things. Because if we fight it, if we, we, if we are upset with it, for one angle, it's actually false personality fighting with itself, false personality judging itself. And this doesn't actually work because we, 
if we reject some aspect of ourselves and we, we are upset with some aspect of ourselves, then we set up some internal warfare that maintains that particular thing. So only more like in the thorough, loving, benevolent, curious investigation uh, with a full acceptance of that, without judging it, that can be mm, diminished, understood, and it, it releases. Well, it's what's interesting too is our concern isn't really with false personality. Um, this becomes a study, but the reason we study this is our concern is our inner being, the silence of being in us from where presence and awareness emanates and where it is conscious as itself at the core of ourselves, who we are. That's our real concern. And, and what is Mihai said that this false personality develops in us and then it stifles that. And the fourth way terminology, this part of us literally forgets about itself. It almost disavows itself because it's under pressure now to meet expectations that the world starts to impose on it because those expectations correlate with a sense of identity this is me now in relation to the world and now i my false person i as a false personality start to develop expectations of myself and this is where almost all human inner conflict comes from our sense of expectation relative to the world and other people and our sense of expectation relative to ourselves this is a whole arena of psychological uh, uh, conflict, is a, is a good word. And that's why we feel ill at ease often. We're not content and we're not happy with our life and we're not happy with our job or our relationship or whatever it is. We have these, because it, we have these expectations and they're not met. And then when we learn about false personality and set about trying to study it, what happens is we then start to have an expectation about getting rid of false personality. And that's why I say that's not really our concern. Our concern is what is at the source of our being? Who are we deep within ourselves where we're more quiet and um, true is, is a nice way to think of it. I was going to say also still, but it's what Peter Spensky called the quiet place within. And we all know this feeling and we all know that it's it's meaningful to to be, to be from there, to be from, to manifest from there. But often, very quickly, these layers get added of expectation. We start to act in a certain way. In the fourth way, we do things like we start to just talk unnecessarily because we need, we feel we need to project an identity to other people. We lie. We talk about things we don't know in order to appear as though we are somebody who knows something. And this covers up this innocence of, you know what, of not knowing. There's so much we really don't know about our creation, even about other human beings. We, when you really investigate it, there's so much we don't know. But that's not what happens with false personality. We adopt, I must know everything. I must gather all the information. I must form strong opinions. I must argue. I must resist. I must talk and lie and become identified, uh, in relation with, especially in relation to other people. But even at home, if I'm getting dressed and I'm by myself, but I'm imagining how I'm going to look in relation to other people, how they're going to perceive me. Uh, and so then I, I'm i caught up still in this image of myself. That's not this deeper sense of me. There's nothing wrong, of course, with dressing up and trying to look nice, but when it's all caught up in a sense of identity, that's false personality. And another strong area, of course, in the fourth way, where there's a lot of emphasis, is the area of negative emotions. And in particular, the area of expressing, uh, especially in a very animated way, in an explosive way, negative emotions. Or, as Mihai knows, and as he works with a lot of his clients, suppression. That is also false personality. Uh, it's this base, this ego, this idea of myself. I must protect myself. I must push that down. I don't want to feel that. And so false personality can burrow its head in the sand as well as burst itself out onto the scene of the world 
I am angry. I am upset. I am irritated. I am frustrated. I am having problems. And I want to let everybody know it because then it validates my sense of identity. And just to add to that, I'll say that Peter Spensky pointed out when we're born as essence, we don't have this. Um, there's not a factory inside us all ready to go to produce negative emotions. It's something we develop. We learn from other people how to respond to situations with negative emotions. And as he, as Uspensky pointed out, there's no real center in us for negative emotions. Even though the instinctive and emotional centers often combine to, to produce negative emotions, the, this false personality acts, as he said, as an artificial center in us that manufactures, indulges in, and expresses or and or suppresses negative emotions. And this becomes a big area, an important area in the fourth way system for the study of false personality. And it goes back to chief feature, which me I mentioned also. This core, it's like the core around which the apple of false personality develops. And now it's encased in this false personality. And it's um it comes to, uh, it's like the at the source of what we defend is our idea of ourselves. And we then encase ourselves with negative emotions of different kinds in order to buffet ourselves against being um, uh, really exposed as an artificial identity. This one is the first one. This term negative emotion is, is not, it's a, it's a fourth way term. So it doesn't mean that we cannot have sadness or frustration or grief or fear. That's not what is meant by negative emotion. Negative emotion in the fourth way is a whole uh, production, a whole cocktail uh, based on uh, various energies and uh, imaginary attitudes and a sense of righteousness and so it's not just an emotion and uh, you can refer to previous videos where we go in depth about these um, negative emotions and non-expression of negative emotion as a way to diminish actually diminish this false personality energy and use this charged energy to to investigate our uh, our wrong attitudes, what I mean, untruthful attitudes about ourselves or the world, and also use this intense charged pain body energy to to um, fuel this rather than in explosions or self beating, to fuel this towards more presence. Is People come to me as a somatic psychotherapist and they have some type of suffering of sorts. And I always find that underneath a certain kind of this, under some kind of addiction or compulsion or or painful relational pattern or certain kind of self-sabotage or something like that, underneath some kind of, um, as I said, one of these patterns, there is a, a sense some core negative message about oneself what what is called deficiency identity deficiency story identity um which was formed early on by a child's essence when they were like four or five or six in connection with how other people treated one or in connection to just simple events uh that the child for lack of understanding or you know, uh, to develop this, oh, it must be, this happened, or the dad is like that, or mommy left, or whatever is happening, it's because of me, because I'm not good enough, or because I, I'm not lovable, or because it's my fault. So you see, there's some kind of innocence, innocence of essence that developed these beliefs in heightened painful moments and that becomes the seed in some way of this deficiency identity which is the core of false personality uh not good enough i'm a failure uh, i'm hopeless i'm a fuck up 
uh, there's something wrong with me, I cannot love, I won't amount to anything. It's, you know, uh, all of this, I'm just... There or are I'm cases. wonderful. Yeah. I'm, I'm invulnerable. I'm superior. I am always right. I always know everything. I can do anything. Mm -hmm. I can take charge. I'm the best. Um, I'm people admire me. So it's the other side. And this is too. Uh, a one way to observe false personality quickly and often is in the area of judgment. Mm. False personality essence does not judge. Essence just sort of beholds. It just sees what's happening. It looks and it sees what's happening. But the judgment, this evaluation process that goes on psychologically is a characteristic of false personality. And it's quite subtle, but we can all see that it's like a barometer. It's always going up and then down and then up. And then we, we evaluate something. We look at other people and we're either giving them credit for things. So the barometer goes up sort of in positive mode. And then we are criticizing. We're finding fault with them. We're accusing them. We're gossiping about them. We're even if it's internal, we are condemning them, belittling them, putting them, demeaning them, and um, this, all of this, is false personality. And uh, then we do the same thing, of course, with ourselves. We're almost always. You can see it throughout the day. I feel pretty good. I'm, you know, this is good. <laughs> Feeling pretty good. And then it's like, man, oh God, why'd they say that? Oh, uh, this isn't going to work. Or I'm, I, it, so the, it, just to say this barometer goes up and it goes down in all of us all the time in little and then in extreme ways too. But to look for judgment and to look for criticism of others, judgment and criticism of other people and of ourselves. And then of course, what happens, we extend it to situations, to my job. Some days I really like, yeah, this is a pretty, God, it's a pretty nice job. You know, I like this job. Uh, and then this is the worst. I, I got to get out of here. And this is the same barometer, the same critical fact faculty, you could call it in us. And many times we're taught to think this is this makes us smart. This makes us perceptive. This makes us we think we'd be having discrimination because we we're able to really evaluate the world and be critical and judgmental and assess it for better or for worse. And it's almost always false personality that's doing this. Rarely do we look out at the world and at other people and ourselves and see ourselves objectively, meaning truthfully as things really are. False personalities, twisting the picture, clouding the picture, misconstruing what it sees in order to validate a sense of self inside in a positive or a negative way. It's a big study. Yeah, I like what you said is that although clinically people come with a more deficient sense and deflated sense of identity, um, one can have inflated sense of identity, false personality. And uh, I, 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 I had like this as an inflated sense of false personality with like arrogance. I know better. I am better. Uh, and with this... Um, wanting to be recognized, wanting to be seen, wanting people to know. But at the same time, I notice in myself and other people, one can coexist. There can be here like, hey, I, I, I got this. I know, look at me. And at another layer uh, of the onion, it's like, oh, I, no, I don't have what it takes. I'm not good enough. So they can all coexist. And what, often that happens, you know, you're out in the world mm -hmm. and you, and the inflation happens and you're projecting, you're trying to convince other people. Mm -hmm. You're really trying to convince yourself, but you're doing it in the form of convincing other people that you are valid and strong and capable. And then you go home and close the door. Mm -hmm. And that's where it flips into its negative often. And people, they deflate very quickly and they go, oh my gosh, it's really terrible. But then someone opens their front door and they, oh, Hi. And they're back to this projection of everything's fine. I'm wonderful. You're wonderful. Um, you know, if you look at Facebook, everybody looks like everything's wonderful all the time. Uh -huh. And it's uh, it's almost like, I mean, it's not always true, of course, with everything, with something like Facebook, but it's it could almost be called false book uh -huh. in many instances because it's a projection of an identity of me in relation to the world. And it's how I want to be perceived. And 
but at the deepest part of it, it's how I imagine myself. And I want other people to agree and confirm and affirm that this is who I am. And it's not who we are really at our core. And that, which is our main, that's our main focus in the end here with all this work called the fourth way. Mm. It's to come back to the truest, most real, most genuine part of our, our inner being. Part of knowing oneself is to know one's false sense of self, one's false personality. And the other aspect of knowing oneself, which comes later, is as this false sense of self is loosening up, diminishing, less charge, less intense, there's less power in the company. Now there's more spaciousness. One's essence is quite in a quiet place within that has very clear preferences. So this starts to be more in charge. And the knowing oneself is also knowing that, as well as knowing the knower. That's more like advanced work, knowing, being aware of, of whatever this is which is perceiving. Yeah. However, we can't go there initially. It's too abstract. It's not practical as long as false personality is so rampant and active. So the point of fourth way work is to, as you turn, have more light and you strengthen the light or flashlight, then we need to start observing our false personality and to become like a, like a researcher, a scientist, where we know this thoroughly. Yeah, I mentioned the attitude of observation, like not judging, not fighting it, just very uh, benevolently neutral. But right on, we need to know our shit, as they say. We need to know it, because if we are not aware of our false personality, we don't study it, we are it all the time. So part of the work is to be more awake, to find it out, know it. And it's not, we don't, you know, false personality is two or three things, three or four things we have. It's not like a rocket science. And we'll find those manifestations over and over again in us and other people. So we need to know them and struggle with them. And maybe we can talk now a little mm -hmm. bit what are some of these core manifestations of false personality? And we talked before, but it's important to be touched upon. This false personality is like a whole show. And it's like, it's it can be seen. It's obvious. It's obvious to oneself. Like, oh God, I went this again. I justified myself and I defended myself and I just talked about myself all the time. So it's it's visible, all of this show. But underneath that, there is this uh, sense of me, like the sense of separate me out of which it, it emanates. So but we first start with knowing the investigating the show um, and diminishing it, starving it, quieting down to actually get to the very uh, Wizard of Oz, you were saying. Mm -hmm. We have to get to the actual Wizard of Oz. So I would like to go now into what are some of these core <laughs> loud things that we have no doubt. Whenever I'm engaging in this, I know that mm -hmm. it, has a, clear, it has yeah. a certain flavor. Right. And and it's an art form, really. We can be going to specifics and you can turn it into a science, really, to study the manifestations of false personality. But the art of it is uh recognizing its flavor and mm. and that's up to each of us because our false personality has a slightly different flavor mm. than somebody else's but and this is where the idea of judgment and being critical comes in this is such a good area to watch it and you said a minute ago mihai we start to observe for a minute or two or three and then we we um judge what we observe in ourselves and this is actually false personality reacting to our observations of false personality. Mm -hmm. So this is a good you know, to criticize. Another way to see it 
uh, interestingly enough, is to notice what irritates us in other people. Mm. This is a beautiful study if you can do it from the right perspective. Because usually when we're irritated by another person, it's indicative of something in ourselves. And so, you know, we like to be with people who don't cause us any angst. Um, and usually because that makes our false personality comfortable, those people. And to be in situations where we're with people we don't, they're like, God, look at that. Look at how it's showing off. But why does that person never say what they think? Or we're, we're critical. And so we can use this this um it's like a measure it's like a measuring rod you can put it out into the world and detect things that you find irritating about other people and it can sort of send a signal back to you that's interesting why is that so affect me so much inevitably almost in every situation it's because we have something of the same or similar in ourselves this also brings up the point that it's not so easy to see below just the superficial layer of false personality in ourselves. They're like layers. We have layers of armor, layers of psychological identity. And, and, and the whole thing has become a thick woven fabric of how we imagine ourselves and how we project ourselves. But is this connects to the idea of not being judgmental of false personality. You said... Mm -hmm. It's important to benevolent, what did you say, benevolent? Benevolent and neutral observation. Yes, to observe impartially and benevolently, to not be critical of ourselves and of other people, If you know, to slip past that limitation. And the reason is we want to be able to use this, um, this blanket of, 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 of our false personality. We want to be able to unwrap it and see the whole thing, and then see that we are not that. Mm. So we this is because it, the, the, this blanket is covering up this um, simple, true, very deep, actually, part of ourselves that is not visible. And the blanket, you see, is all visible. It's all about being visible. And so we want to take off this blanket. It would be like undressing completely. And then realizing who we are without all these psychological garments. And we need this process of unwrapping to come to that in a in a in a meaningful way. So false personality is not bad. And it became, can become, as you said, a, a very we can become a, an investigator, a benevolent investigator of ourselves. This is true self-investigation, investigation of our false sense of ourselves. Yeah, I think in the fourth way, one of the teachers would say, learn to observe yourself or investigate yourself as if you are observing a curious, interesting stranger. <laughs> and also this attitude of like a true scientist, a true scientist that observes like a, a new type of butterfly on a deserted island or a certain creature doesn't want to mess with it and interfere with it it's just just this observing it when it comes out of the when it comes out of the hiding and what does it eat and what does it think or well, this this uh, this inner tendency of some aspect of our false personality when it comes with what people what time of the day what does it say? What is the attitude about oneself? How does it try to be seen in a certain way? Or how does it try to not be seen? That's the thing. Some false personalities want to be seen. And some person wants not to be seen. <laughs> you know, so that's why you can't. I mean, we, we are going to give some clear flavors of it. So we know. But ultimately, what Peter said and also Peter Ruspensky said, it's like a certain kind of creature, like a certain kind of dog. And it has a certain smell, has a certain kind of fur. So it will start to get to know it by taste, by flavor. And what will happen often too is the more you start to observe this in yourself, you will feel this flavor. You will feel this energy overtake you. You're with someone or you're with people and you're manifesting and you will feel it 
and you cannot stop it. Mm. And it becomes un unpleasant, it becomes uncomfortable. And this is when we're starting to really see this image of ourselves. Because what's becoming uncomfortable is that very image. It's now being exposed. And it had covered it, you know, it was all these blanks it didn't want to be seen. And so uh, it's not simply a matter of just, you know, observing our false personality. We have to live the experience mm -hmm. of seeing it and mm -hmm. having it be seen by us. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's like going it's like going through a gauntlet, a psychological gauntlet of we have to go through this veil of who we imagine ourselves to be mm. to begin to discover what we really are uh, behind that. And, uh, we're not, you know, we jokingly said at the beginning, how are we going to kill false personality? But it is true. It's sort of like slaying a dragon or starving um, this part of ourselves. We do want to take its oxygen away. You know, and the more you do that, the more you see it kind of um, complain and and slither away and get uncomfortable and fight back. And this is another thing that the fourth way reminds us of. False personality fights back. We are very attached to this imaginary idea of ourselves. We're so accustomed to it. And when we feel we're giving it up, we feel like we kind of don't have any, we don't exist. We don't, we no longer have anything. A small example, you know, there are some people who they always want to be on top of an argument or a discussion. They always want to end up on top with the last word or knowing everything or having the right opinion, proving other people wrong, things like this. For someone like that to simply resist offering their opinion. <laughs> when there's a discussion or to wait five minutes or to wait 10 minutes can be excruciating, excruciatingly difficult for someone whose false personality is accustomed to always being the one who's right, always knowing everything, always being on top. The other extreme is someone who just sits quietly and never says anything, never says no when they feel like, no, come on, uh, Peter, you want to go? Let's, we're all going to go, blah, blah. And I don't want to go, but I don't, I just, I could say no. No, thank you. I don't want to go. But what happens is false personality goes along and is miserable. Um, so some people need to learn to be more vocal. That's a way for them to actually work against their false personality. These are just two examples out of many. We talked here that, yes, watch out for this. I observe some aspect of my false personality. Let's say wanting to get attention, going in a group and wanting to get attention and talking and and then I I become aware of it and I know what that is. And then it's like, oh man, you did it again. And also this this quality of vanity, wanting to be recognized, wanting to be seen wanting to be perfect in order to you know this quality of vanity is interested to work on itself to be more perfect and more wonderful so sometimes false some aspect of one's should no longer have a false personality yeah yes to no longer appear to have a false personality yeah because it knows other people will judge it if it yeah if it if it had yes yeah so it can the be the illusion is tricky pernicious now, this being said, there is a, some kind of pain that I notice with people that they start to see them, see their, see themselves. What I mean, see themselves, see their falseness. They're like, "Oh God, I mean, I have this and have these judgments and like, and this, this beating myself up and this pattern that." So yeah, th there's something here. This is um, some conscience. Conscience is that. Seeing one's falseness, seeing one's pain, seeing the the pain I inflict on others and myself unwillingly, and it it's heavy. So uh, actually, Gurdjie was saying that uh, if you start to see yourself, you are going to be horrified. Right? Yeah, all one's 
what Peter said before, it's also very Jungian, the shadow principle, like something that bothers me in other people. So be very interested in what bothers you about other people because there's a lot of information for self-investigation here. It's very likely I have this thing and I don't like it. I, I have this thing and my false personality doesn't like that. So then it shadows it out to other people and I see it in other people a lot. And sometimes we don't even know that we don't like it in ourselves. Mm -hmm. And uh, what's interesting is we don't like it in someone else. Mm -hmm. And this is what's so interesting. And we think it's about them. When we don't like it in them, it's actually because it's in us in some fashion. And so this study of other people serves as a, as a lens for looking back, shining that lens back at ourselves to see or to try to begin to see the source of that. Mm -hmm. Because we don't see it in ourselves initially that we are like that. This is how um, self-deceived we are about ourselves. We don't even see our weaknesses, our false. And I say weaknesses from the point of view of knowing who we really are and our, how we deceive ourselves about who we really are and what we really are. But we get irritated by these things in other people. And it's uh, it takes a lot of honesty and a lot of courage and a lot of patience to and not even be able to know at first what it is, but just to carry it with you for an hour a day. Why did Joe, when Joe did that, why did it bother me so much? That's mm -hmm. interesting. Mm -hmm. And just to let it settle and mm -hmm. see what we can discover. And inevitably what will happen if you continue that is then when it pops up in you, you will almost see Joe. Mm -hmm. You will see yourself becoming Joe. And then you'll go, ah, oh, yes, there it is. That's it. This Anything where this flavor of taking things personally, you know, somebody said something or did something and I'm offended, I'm bothered, I'm triggered. Very, be very interested in your triggers. Triggers are rich, uh, rich material. Usually we are triggered because there's some false personality sensitivity that is touched. Um, making assumptions about people, making stories about people. Um, this one thing to get yeah, one of my teachers was saying that some of the core tentacles or prawns of the ego is wanting to get recognition, wanting to get recognition and love and approval, um, wanting to be seen, uh, wanting to be deemed wonderful, wanting to control wanting to control, even to control myself, control others, control situation, control reality, how things should be. Anything to do with this should. He shouldn't do this. They shouldn't be done. This shouldn't happen. <laughs> this is all false personality. And control can also take the form of resistance, just always resisting, because it is a form of controlling things for, for one's sense of identity. Some people are just really good at resisting everything. Mm -hmm. That's like you could almost say that someone's chief feature is always saying no first. Their first reaction is always no. Always some manner of form of resistance. So it's not just yeah. me being obsessive about controlling things and controlling mm -hmm. other people or being bossy or mm -hmm. being pushy. Uh, I can take what is often called passive aggressive mm -hmm. uh, control. There's also this um, this trying to control in order to be safe. Underneath this is that the world is not safe. I'm not safe. I need to protect myself by, by isolating myself, by avoiding going out, by avoiding relationship, by avoiding new things and being in this cocoon while being a super nice, generous, loving guy. You know, I know, I know this. So it doesn't need to be obnoxious loud it can be very sweet man and very uh, you know but it's still is this element of yeah trying to protect myself and being in a small box so as we took a little break here we 
just realize that one core aspect of the false personality is that it creates conflict and issues within oneself and with other people. All of this conflict and problems at some individual scale and righteousness and issues with people, family members, with the world, all of this, uh, this is any conflict, any issue. There is some aspect of false personality there that plays out also at the, at the level of nations and basically why this unusual species here, the human beings, they have all this killing each other. When my, my grandfather used to say that the human is the only creature here that kill each other when they're not hungry god you know yeah so um this wow. is more like false personality uh spreading bleeding at the level of a global global scale nations our irritations our judgments all of this it, uh, it, if when you investigate it it's unnecessary we can live our lives completely without that mm -hmm. and when you actually when you take all of that away from yourself and from your psyche and from your life life is very simple and life is um flows you could say naturally instead of there always being a bump on the road or a pothole in the next step and something to be afraid of and something to worry about something to feel anxious about all of that unnecessary suffering is due to what, what the fourth way calls false personality. And this is the knot we're trying to untie, unravel um, in ourselves to come to the reality of just being a human being on planet Earth without all of this artificial uh, shroud, both in ourselves and in the way we look at the world. It's so interesting to think that the conflict around the earth between nations, as you were saying, between cultures, between religions, between political parties, you name it, all of it is artificial. And yet all of it is part of the design of human creation on earth. This is this in itself is very interesting. But from the individual point of view, it's unnecessary. We don't need it. We can live without it. And then that's where our possibilities of self-transformation awakening enlightenment but the fourth way calls evolution all starts to come into play we can be free of all of these what the fourth way also calls laws and false personality is really a series of laws you can think of it that we are under in ourselves and we can escape from these laws this law of false personality and we'll be much lighter and more content without it and actually able to function better. Mm -hmm. We are talking about this topic uh, from the point of view of awakening, you know, awakening and reaching high levels of being, uh, realizing that the true identity is a presence, and also going beyond that into realizing that other let's say, cosmic truths and the truth of reality. But in order to go there, one cannot go from being in false personality, basically there's a false personality and then false personality going towards enlightenment or liberation. It doesn't work like that. So, so this false personality identity needs to diminish a lot, needs to become disabled somehow, to, to not be operational. And then, uh, because this spends a lot of energy here, actually this, first of all, it has a lot of thoughts. When one is in false personality, it's a lot of thoughts, it's a lot of reactivity, a lot of problems, a lot of imaginary problems, a lot of uh, past and future. It's uh, complex, complicated, and it's unhappy, actually, really. So one needs, this needs to die. And I'm I'm saying this not that we have to kill it or destroy it, but this needs to die. The good news is that this is not real. <laughs> it's not real. It's a fabrication. And actually, one is will be much happier, much happier, and 
one will live, as Peter said, more flow, spontaneous, easier, less conflicts. Um, so in the Gurdjieff, Gurdjieff talks about that in the Gospels too, that from one angle, one can see the fourth way work or esoteric Christianity, which we are going to do another video later about it. On these three phases to the process is to, to wake up, to become more conscious, to awaken, to become more conscious, to die and to be born, to be reborn, to awaken, to die and to be reborn. So one needs to be a little bit more conscious, more aware to investigate all this false personality, ego, lies, habits, deceit, pretenses, all this useless, painful stuff. Deus needs to die in order for something else to be born. And that something else to be born is essence becoming aware of itself. Yeah. Um, and one, you know, usually there's this mistake of awakening. Awakening is the final product. <laughs> but the way we look at it in the fourth way, one needs to be more conscious to realize the, the terrible things that are happening uh, in our basement and shining and those need to die now how does it die or we can maybe uh, go in this direction uh, what is the work with false personality what is the how how does it die how does it diminish what are the necessary ingredients for a skillful work towards diminishing false personality Well, this is where we also start to get into what the fourth way calls the obstacles to awakening, because all of these obstacles mm. are essentially manifestations of false personality in us. And those are, we've mentioned them before, but very quickly, imagination, especially this daydreaming churning of thoughts where we're lost in thought, and it's usually revolving around our something to do with us. Mm -hmm. So imagination, identification, meaning we're always getting lost in our activities, in our emotions, our thoughts, other people. We we lose a sense of this inner sense of being. It's the first thing to go when we're identified. Out it goes. Mm -hmm. And and our this awareness coming from us, this consciousness emanating from us, goes out, attaches to things, and ends up forming as an identity in relation to our own thoughts, our own emotions, our own lives. So imagination and identification, what's called inner considering, as Mihai mentioned, where we're constantly measuring and worrying about what other people think of us, how we think we should measure up to their requirements or they should measure up and meet our requirements. Um, and then this uh, idea of unnecessary talk, where we talk when we don't need to talk, we're talking just to fill space to kind of appear to be somebody. And when we lie, when we actually talk about things as if we knew what we were talking about. But it goes even farther than that, further than that, to lying about who we imagine ourselves to be. We lie to ourselves about who we imagine ourselves to be. And then the culmination of all of these is this overindulgence and manufacturing of what the fourth way calls negative emotions, where we turn our view of the world into a negation, a rejection of what's really happening and of what we really are. And we cover all of that up and we do it in this form of negative, what the system calls negative emotions, which comes from negare, to negate. They are emotions that negate reality. Uh, so each of these is uh, something we will go into. We've gone into each of these in some other videos that are, well, we would recommend you watch if you're interested in this. We The fourth way recommends methods, which are really, they appear to be methods of quote unquote, working against our false personality. They're really methods of exposing false, rendering it visible in ourselves. And the more it's rendered visible, the more it will, it will, by necessity, weaken because it operates successfully because it does so in the dark, meaning with, without the light of consciousness on it. And I think um, just, to, just to conclude our video for today, 
because we've, we we have put forth a lot of information here. And to consolidate all that takes time to digest it, consolidate it, integrate it into the, uh, the whole of what this work is takes time. But I wanted to say, in con partly in conclusion, before you might have anything else to add, Mihai, is that we each of us knows, each of us can find in ourselves, deep in ourselves, this inner compass. It may be deep tucked away in a, some pocket in our being but we have it we have this compass and we know yes i want to i want to go come back to being what i really am and we, uh, this isn't this thing about false personality is not a terrible thing it doesn't make us a bad person it's simply not a representation of who we and what we really are. And we can find this compass and follow it, have it lead us back to who we are. And that's really what the fourth way is designed for too. Like all the great teachings, really it's to enable us to rediscover this compass in ourselves and then trust this compass to being who we really are. And it's people who watch this kind of video uh, who who know what I'm talking about, who feel this, yes, yes, I want to reach again into that pocket and find that compass and return to being who I really am. And that's what, in the end, that's where this will lead us, all this work in relation to false person. That's where it's designed to lead us. And uh, yeah, may this uh, help with your inner compass to navigate this uh, treacherous uh treacherous waters of of painful illusions and get to the shores of more simplicity and the quiet place within and as well as the the peace that passes and passes understanding so thank you everyone chop chop thank you <laughs>